I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the Old Testament to 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings 7, we'll look at the whole chapter this evening. I remind you that this is the word of the living God. And so let us give our attention to its reading. Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, and its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And it was built on four rows of cedar pillars, with cedar beams on the pillars. And it was covered with cedar above the chambers that were on the 45 pillars, 15 in each row. There were window frames in three rows, and window opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and windows had square frames, and window was opposite window in three tiers. And he made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits and its breadth 30 cubits. There was a porch in front with pillars and a canopy in front of them. And he made the hall of the throne where he was to pronounce judgment, even the hall of judgment. It was finished with cedar from floor to rafters. His own house where he was to dwell in the other court back of the hall was of light workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter whom he had taken in marriage. All these were made of costly stones cut according to measure, sawed with saws back and front, even from the foundation to the coping, and from the outside to the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, huge stones, stones of eight and ten cubits, and above were costly stones cut according to measurement and cedar. The great court had three courses of cut stone all around, and a course of cedar beams, so had the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the house. And King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in bronze. And he was full of wisdom, understanding, and skill for making any work in bronze. He came to King Solomon and did all his work. He cast two pillars of bronze. Eighteen cubits was the height of one pillar, and a line of twelve cubits measured its circumference. It was hollow, and its thickness was four fingers. The second pillar was the same. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. The height of one of the capitals was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. There were lattices of checker work with wreaths of chain work for the capitals on the tops of the pillars, a lattice for the one capital, and a lattice for the other capital. Likewise, he made pomegranates in two rows around the one lattice work to cover the capital that was on the top of the pillar, and he did the same with the other capital. Now the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars in the vestibule were of lily work, four cubits. The capitals were on the two pillars and also above the rounded projection which was beside the lattice work. There were two hundred pomegranates in two rows all around and so with the other capital. He set up the pillars at the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the south and called its name Yaquim. And he set up the pillar on the north and called its name Boaz. And on the tops of the pillars was lily work. Thus the work of the pillars was finished. Then he made the sea of cast metal. It was round ten cubits from brim to brim and five cubits high and a line of thirty cubits measured its circumference. Under its brim were gourds for ten cubits compassing the sea all around. The gourds were in two rows cast with it when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. The sea was set on them and all their rear parts were inward. Its thickness was a handbreadth, and its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held two thousand baths. He also made the ten stands of bronze. Each stand was four cubits long, four cubits wide, and three cubits high. This was the construction of the stands. They had panels, and the panels were set in the frames, and on the panels that were set in the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. On the frames both above and below the lions and oxen, there were wreaths of beveled work. Moreover, each stand had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and at the four corners were supports for a basin. The supports were cast with wreaths at the side of each. Its opening was within a crown that projected upward one cubit. Its opening was round as a pedestal was made, a cubit and a half deep. At its opening there were carvings, and its panels were were square, not round. And the four wheels were underneath the panels. The axles of the wheels were of one piece with the stand, and the height of a wheel was a cubit and a half. The wheels were made like a chariot wheel, 
Their axles, their rims, their spokes, and their hubs were all cast. There were four supports at the four corners of each stand. The supports were of one piece with the stands. And on the top of the stand there was a round band half a cubit high. And on the top of the stand its stays and its panels were of one piece with it. And on the surfaces of its stays and on its panels he carved cherubim, lions, and palm trees according to the space of each, with wreaths all around. After this manner he made ten stands. All of them were cast alike, of the same measure and the same form. And he made ten basins of bronze. Each basin held forty baths. Each basin measured four cubits, and there was a basin for each of the ten stands. And he set the stands five on the south side of the house, and five on the north side of the house. And he set the sea at the southeast corner of the house. Hiram also made the pots, the shovels, and the basins. So Hiram finished all the work that he did for King Solomon in the house of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowls of the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars, and the two lattice works to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on tops of the pillars. And the four hundred pomegranates for the two lattice works, two rows of pomegranates for each lattice work to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the pillars, the ten stands and the ten basins on the stands, and the one sea and the twelve oxen underneath the sea. Now the pots, the shovels, and the basins, all these vessels in the house of the Lord, which Hiram made for King Solomon, were of burnished bronze. In the plain of the Jordan the king cast them, in the clay ground between Sukkoth and Zarathon. And Solomon left all the vessels unweighed, because there were so many of them. The weight of the bronze was not ascertained. So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden altar, the golden table for the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the south side and five on the north, before the inner sanctuary, the flowers, the lamps, and the tongs of gold, the cups, snuffers, basins, dishes for incense, and fire pans of pure gold, and the sockets of gold for the doors of the innermost part of the house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the nave of the temple. Thus all the work that King Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and stored them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. The rest withers. The flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our study tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word given to us this night. Lord, help us, having given our attention to its reading and now hear its explanation, its proclamation, that we may understand how it is that this Old Testament temple, glorious as it was, would give way to something even more glorious. The temple that you are building, your church, your people, all of this through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we are in the middle of considering the reign of Solomon, David's son, really not the second, but the third king of Israel. He was installed as king after David, and really by David's hand and his insurance that, uh, that Adonijah would not become king. By the time that we get to chapter 9 of 1 Kings, we'll have covered roughly half of his 40-year reign. By chapter 10, Solomon will fall away from the Lord. And in chapter 12, the kingdom will be divided. Given Solomon's significance as David's son, it's remarkable how little time is devoted to his reign, especially when we think that chapters 5 through 8 of this book are devoted to his construction projects. David had prepared for the Lord's house, and Solomon was the one to build it. We've been looking then at the building of the temple, the preparations for it beginning back in chapter 5. The building of it in chapter 6 is what we looked at last time. We focused our attention on the purpose of this temple. The glorious structure that it was, its purpose was to be a place where the Lord would dwell with his people. This is one of the key images the New Testament authors will pick up on. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul would write in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the purpose of the temple, 
just as the tabernacle was God's presence among the people or where God would be present among the people. So the temple was that special place. Well, we're still working through the construction of the temple as you, as you heard in the reading of chapter 8, or chapter 7, I mean. In chapter 8, we will see the temple dedicated, given our attention to the purpose of the temple, to be a replica of heaven, for this is how the presence of God would be with his people. And we won't leave this behind completely, and we want to consider the creation imagery in our chapter tonight. For the temple was a microcosm of all of creation and therefore showed God's sovereign rule over creation for the purpose of comforting his people, providing a place of worship. That sovereignty of God that is clear throughout all of Scripture, we'll come back to it at the end, but it's that fact that God is free and able to do all that he wills, that he reigns over all of creation, and that his will is the final cause of all things. In the Scripture, it is fittingly expressed in the language of kingship. Hear the words of Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. The sovereignty of God, his reign, reminds us also of our place before him. As Psalm 95 would go on to say, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. In our text this evening, in 1 Kings chapter 7, we learn of the priority of worship. This is the purpose of the temple. Yes, that God would be present with His people, but that His people would assemble to worship Him there. We learn this through the finishing of the temple, but also we learn it through the interruption of the building of the temple with Solomon's palace. There are some things here in this chapter which foreshadow Solomon's own troubles. We want to consider those as we work our way through the text. Those cracks that we've been talking about since the start of Solomon's reign are growing. Perhaps we can say that we see the biggest crack yet. So let's look at our text together. First Kings chapter 7, I'll reference the text, but having read it, I'll trust that it's, it's, it's in our minds, but you might want to have it open before you. We begin with the building of Solomon's house. Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. Now if you look in First Kings chapter 9 and verse 10, you read that at the end of 20 years, Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house. We noted that, so, that the house of the Lord took seven years to build, Solomon's own house takes 13 years. One of the questions that I have uh, as I was working through this text is why the narrative intrudes here to tell us of Solomon's house. It's as though the building of Solomon's house interrupts the building of the temple. Maybe the inspired author is giving it to us in the order that it was in Solomon's heart. Even in the Hebrew text, it seems to be presented as an intrusion at the very end of chapter 6, in verse 38, he was seven years in building it. In 1 Kings 7, it opens in the Hebrew, but Solomon was building his own house 13 years. There seems to be this contrast between how long he'd been building the Lord's house and how long he had spent building his own house. And for good reason, we could think that it would take him 13 years. For look at the details of Solomon's own home. It was a grand home. He was referenced as the house of the forest of Lebanon. The idea being that it was a palace that looked like a forest. A palace that had so many pillars that it gave it the appearance of a great forest. Cedar was visible, unlike the temple when it was covered over with gold. But here it's left out. Here it's open. And it is, it, it is abundant, we would say. Moreover, look at its dimensions. Remember that a cubit is 18 inches in length. And so as we look at this and begin to do the math, we realize that the palace of the forest of Lebanon, that is his, his main palace, was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. And that might not be very long by today's standards for a great palace, but this is much, much, much larger than the temple itself. The hall of pillars alone measured 75 feet long by 45 feet wide. But what's more is the worldliness of this palace. The worldliness 
Just look at verse 8. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken in, measure, in marriage. Moreover, unlike the house of the Lord, where all of the stones were not cut by human hand, the emphasis here in this text seems to speak of the great and costly stones that were cut for Pharaoh's house. The significance of the house then gives us some reason for concern. Insofar as we know Solomon's story, we know that his apostasy is right around the corner in our text. So what are those concerns? Well, I've already mentioned one, the interruption of the temple. After this temple is destroyed, laid bare, and, and Israel will come together to rebuild the temple, they begin, they stop, and they begin to build their own houses. And Haggai the prophet would come and rebuke them. He would say, is it a time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? The very concern of David, remember back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that he dwelt in a house and the Lord's, the Lord's tabernacle or, 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 or the, the Ark of the Covenant dwelt in a tent. Solomon seems to have no concern with that. Moreover, there's an expectation in building the temple for this, we just need to think about the, the tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle that was built and looked much like the temple, although it was half of its size, but it was that portable temple that would go with Israel throughout the wilderness. When it is built, when, it, when the construction is finished in Exodus chapter 40, we read that after it's all set up and Moses finished the work, the cloud covered the tent of meeting. The glory of God filled the tabernacle. In a sense, we would expect that at the end of chapter 6, Everything has been built. But here is an interruption. Not an interruption of the Spirit of God, but an interruption of the plans of man. Solomon's own grand plans and grandeur reflect what we know of his life in the chapters to come. Unlike his father, who saw that he dwelt in a house of cedar, the ark of God dwelt in a tent. Solomon wanted to build his house of cedar. Solomon's devotion to the work of building the temple, given that, even though that was true, he seems also concerned, or maybe we can say more concerned, with the details and size of his palace and with the sanctuary where God would be worshipped. In some way, Solomon was more devoted to his own glory than he was to the glory of the Lord. As I said, this, this comes out uh, in, in the great and glorious stones that are laid. As one commentator put it, this has more in common with Babel than it does with God's commands. He did everything imaginable to show that as Yahweh was a great God, he was a great king. What is displayed here is far more Solomon's riches and honor than his wisdom. He was, as one commentator put it, undoubtedly the piety of worldly success. His was undoubtedly the piety of worldly success. It was a man-made structure, made for man, to show man's glory. We get a, a hint of this later on in 1 Kings 10, verses 4 and 5, when the Queen of Sheba comes to, to see all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his officials, the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings. There was no more breath in her. And most telling is the palace that Solomon built for Pharaoh's daughter. For we read in 1 Kings 11, that Solomon would have 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And there in verse 3 we read, And his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. This moment here, this palace being built, Solomon's palace is a kind of intrusion then, to the temple. It's not a, a, a side note, though. Indeed, it reminds us of the importance, the priority of worship, and how so many other things do, in fact, intrude. So we'll take up Solomon's life in the chapters to come, but let's continue, because the text continues. The temple is finished. 
The temple is finished. He, he goes on to speak of the artists that, that make the pillars. Hiram from Tyre, not the same Hiram that we'd seen before, who was the king of Tyre, the one who provided all, all of the trees from Lebanon. No, this was a man who was half Israelite, the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, his father a man of Tyre. He was full of wisdom, understanding, and skill. This is the same language that would be used in Exodus chapter 35 to speak of Bezalel and Aholiab. To be the ones who are filled with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, with all craftsmanship. In other words, their gifts were given by God for this purpose. And so Hiram of Tyre comes and he casts all the things of bronze. Now in Scripture, bronze will often denote the Gentiles. This is particularly true in the book of Daniel. Perhaps it's fitting then that one who is half Gentile is called to come and to cast these pillars and the oxen and all the other things. But what are these two pillars of bronze? As we read the descriptions, they are very large pillars. And they have a, a kind of crown on top and surrounded by lattice work, surrounded by pomegranates. They would be placed on either side of the entrance to the holy place. Bronze, we can say, signifies their strength, but their further significance is seen in their names. The one is Joachim, and the other is Boaz. They are set up there at the vestibule of the temple, one on the south side and one on the north. But these names, Joachim and Boaz. Joachim may, means may he establish, that is, may God establish. And Boaz means the Lord is mighty. Perhaps we can render it this way, that God will establish the throne of David and his kingdom forever. That is, his strength, Lord, the Lord is mighty. And he is the one who establishes the king. This would denote then the position of the Davidic dynasty in relationship to God's sovereignty. The king was not to rule over all of Israel on his own abilities, but rather he was to rule in place of God, that is, under God's authority, placed there by the Lord. The descendants of David were not to see their own strength in their rule, but God's. He is the great king over creation, and especially over his people. The temple was not the work of man, but it was the work of God. This is the foundation, we can say. These are the pillars that would be laid to remind the priests every time they walked past them of who was truly the king. Who it was that had established all that they did. Established the work of our hands. They would pray. It would be God who would establish it. And what's more, we see not just the pillars, we see the waters. And the waters are seen in two different places or two different ways. First, there was this great sea that was, that, was, that was cast of metal. It was 15 feet wide, seven and a half feet high. I don't think it had anything to do with washings. The more that I studied, there, there, there was no ladder. There's no way to access it. And though it talks about the lip having kind of a rounded edge, it's not as though they could lift it. It was so heavy, particularly when it would hold 10,000 gallons of water or 2,000 baths. Everything about this is meant to show the greatness and the grandeur. Not just only is it seven and a half feet high, but it's on top of the 12 oxen, three facing each direction on the compass. But remember what we said so far, the temple is a replica of creation. The Holy of Holies is the invisible heaven where the Lord dwells. The holy place is the visible heavens that we can see. Just look down at verse 49 and notice the ten lampstands that would resemble the lights in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The courtyard, the outer court that we're considering now represented then the earth. The altar was made of earth. There was, a, there was this sea encircled by decorations that would represent plant life on the earth and the oxen representing the animals. All of it reminding us that God is king over creation, the sovereign Lord who rules and reigns over all. 
the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. This repetition that we find in the Psalms, this repetition that we find of God speaking of his own authority is imaged then here in the temple. It's almost surprising to think about how Israel would rather than acknowledge God's sovereign reign over all the earth begin to pull inward and only see themselves. As we said last time, Adam was to extend his reign, so also Israel. Where Adam and Israel would fail, Christ would extend his reign throughout all the earth, through his church, through his people, ruling and reigning over all things for the sake of the church. There's not just the sea, there's more water. There's these ten stands of bronze. They had, they had a cart, they had sort of carts with the wheels and went into great detail to speak of them. And then there was, a, there, was a, there was a kind of basin set on top of it. This extends all the way down to verse 39. And there are rare Hebrew words that are used in the description. And the detail, the cast metal structures is obscure. You probably have a lot of footnotes if you have to have a Bible that shows you different glosses of translations. What we can ascertain is that each of these tanks was six feet in diameter. Each one held 220 gallons of water. And they were movable. They could be rolled back and forth. And they were for the priestly washings as well as the cleansing of the sacrificial animals. Here we are reminded of the purpose of the temple. After all, how can one meet with God when one is sinful, when one is separated from God? The whole purpose of this temple then is to draw near to God even as he draws near to his people. But the only way that could happen is through the sacrifices. Indeed, we read next to the sacrificial tools, the pots, the shovels, the basins, all the things that he made, all those things that, 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 that Hiram had made that were necessary during the times of the sacrifices. We read in verse 47 that it was all unweighed because there were so many of them. The weight of the bronze was not ascertained. That's remarkable, of course, because, because everything else in the temple has been given specific uh, measurement, specific explanation. But here there's just so much. We're going to see this again about having so much, but it will be in chapter 8 when it comes to the sacrifices. They essentially lose count. Lastly, in our text, we see the furnishing of the temple. Look at verse 48. Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden altar, the golden table for the bread of, pres of the presence. We're going to see all of these are covered in gold. You remember that gold signified purity. Indeed, as the priest moved from heaven, from, from earth to heaven, from the outer court to the holy place, and then into the most holy place, they were drawing near to God's presence on earth. So the gold was a visible sign of the need for holiness. Psalm 15 sounds a lot like our psalm that we heard in our call to worship. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, or takes up reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put on his, out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. The purpose of the tabernacle was to declare clearly the holiness of God and our need for holiness in drawing near. Even the golden lampstands, everything covered with gold is meant to signify God's purity. And lastly, we see that the temple becomes a kind of storage place. Not a storage place for things that are unwanted, but things that have been dedicated. Silver, gold, and all the vessels are stored in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. So magnificent and glorious was this temple that the people of Israel would gather there for worship. That the high priest would go in once a year to offer sacrifice for sins. Here it is that we find ourselves learning from the temple when it comes to our own worship. The first thing we see in this temple is that God provided a way for worship. 
the temple was set up in such a way that the priest would move from west to east and moving back towards Eden. Remember that the most holy place was, was, was decorated as a garden. And indeed, this would be signified even further as the priest would pass through the veil with the woven cherubim on them. For in Genesis 3 and verse 24, we read that after sin, after Adam and Eve had sinned, that God drove, out, drove them out of Eden, east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. In the sense, the temple is God's invitation to his people to draw near to him in worship. Second, we learn, as I've tried to stress throughout, that all of creation is under God's dominion. This follows from the fact, as I've already said, that the temple is a replica of creation. The Lord sits in sovereign reign over his new creation image and over the people who are in it and around it. There is nothing that is outside of God's sovereign domain. The sea is most notable here to think about. For the sea in creation, it is that chaotic deep in Genesis 1 over which the Spirit of God hovered. It was that chaotic deep that was under God's complete control that in every other creation story was chaotic and out of control. But the Lord hovered, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. So also this sea is under God's control. The sea that would threaten the Israelites as they departed from Egypt was under God's control. As Job would say, that it is God alone who treads on the waves of the sea. And we remember, of course, our Savior, Jesus Christ, walking upon the waters, walking upon the waters, calming the sea and the storm, caring for his disciples. Thirdly, we learn that worship has in view God's presence with his people. As I said, the whole point is moving back toward that Edenic-like garden. For God has provided all of this temple, all of it for one purpose, that his glory would be known and the communion with his people restored. For the table, for the bread of the presence was indeed to signify God's presence with his people that as the priests would eat there in the presence of God, they would commune with Him. As God spoke about the tabernacle in Exodus 29 and verse 43, so it would be true of the temple. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and they shall be sanctified by my glory. We learn that God provides a way then for us to draw near in worship. And the temple shows us how this is done. You see, as we think about this temple, we cannot forget its purpose or, 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 or all that would take place. Everything that would happen on a daily basis, the morning sacrifices, the evening sacrifices, the sacrifices for sins that would be brought, the day of atonement, all of the blood being spilled over and over again, the water cleansing, the word being spoken. We only draw near to God through being cleansed with blood, water, and word. And that's because this temple teaches us that the only way that we can draw near to our God is through a mediator. In the Old Testament, it was that high priest, that high priest who would offer the sacrifice that one day a year. And yet, Christ would come as a greater sacrifice, as a greater priest. Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12 say, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And here is where we bring it home to our own lives to what we do each and every week as we participate, as we gather for worship. For this chapter speaks to us of the priority of worship. Putting God and His kingdom first puts everything else in its proper place. Even the cracks in Solomon's approach reveal what is truly important. For his house, made with hands and destined to be destroyed with this world, reminds us of the house that Christ makes without hands. 
that cannot be destroyed. For we know, as the Apostle Paul says in Acts 17 and verse 24, that the God who made everything, He made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. No. He would dwell within His own temple. He would dwell within the temple that He makes. That is, He would dwell within His people. This is our hope, beloved. Our hope is not in this world, not in earthly things, but rather in our participation in heavenly, glorious worship. For we come, as Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24 tells us, to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to immeasurable, innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The New Testament confirms over and over and over again that the Old Testament covenant, the Old Testament temple, priest, sacrifice, as glorious as it was, there is something more glorious. That is, more spiritual and more glorious in the sense that it points to heaven. It is true, as we read of the Old Testament temple, we read of an outward glory. We see or, or we can imagine the gold that covered everything. We can imagine the sacrifices that would be given on a daily basis. We can imagine that human, earthly, high priest who would go about his work covered in his special clothing. But what we have is greater. What we have is the fulfillment of all of that. Indeed, everything that we read of in 1 Kings 7 would give way to the glorious temple that God builds, which is His church. Everything that they had in that one priest that would go once a year into the presence of God, we have each and every time we come near to our God through Jesus Christ, the great high priest. This is how our confession talks about it in chapter 7. It says, under the gospel... When Christ, the substance, was exhibited, the, ordinance, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed, that is, the new covenant, are the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy. What we have in Christ is greater than even this temple that Solomon would build. For that temple would be destroyed. And as we read in 2 Corinthians, that if our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That temple would be torn down, not once, but twice. But the temple that Christ builds, you, beloved, it will not be torn down. He will build it, living stone upon living stone. He will gather it from all the four, four corners of the earth. And one day, we will see it in its true glory. That glory that we read of in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. A temple so large that it fills the whole earth. 